Chapter 15, Population, Urbanization, and the Environment. I want to begin by saying that demography is the study of the size and makeup of the human population and how it changes. Their main concern is counting people. From early times, we've had some form of census for the record of uh, sex and age of its members. And the first census was carried out in 1790 and are still carried out every 10 years. There are three variables that can cause the size of the population in a given region to change, and these are births, deaths, and migration. Fertility is a measure of the rate at which people are born. It refers to the actual number of children born to the average woman over her childbearing years, and the childbearing years are considered to be age 15 to 44. Fecundity refers to the potential number of children that could be born to the average woman. So here we're looking at maximum possible. The actual fertility rates tend to be lower than fecundity rates because of economic health and cultural uh, considerations. Now the way we get the crude birth rate, okay, we take the number of live births in any given year for each 1,000 people in the population. And this determines short-term population change. Mortality is a measure of the rate at which people die. And we get the crude death rate the same way we do the crude birth rate, except we're looking at deaths. Okay, you take the number of deaths in any given year for each 1,000 people in the population, which is an index of mortality. Infant mortality rates are the number of deaths within the first year of life per 1,000 every live births in any given year. So, so that one is done just a little bit differently. Um, as far as life expectancy, this reflects on how long, on average, a person born in a particular year is likely to die. Now, the term crude in reference to birth and death rates does not mean that all members of the population, well, it means that not all members of the population are equally likely to die and give birth. Migration is the movement of people into or out of a geographical area. Migration includes both immigration and immigration. Um, they're spelled differently, but, but, but they sound the same, mean two completely different things. IMM immigration means movement into an area, and EMI immigration moves, means movement out of an area. Now, uh, migration can be voluntary or it can be involuntary. And people migrate voluntarily for two reasons. We have what is known as push factors, which are those things that push people away from their homes, such as famines and wars and loss of jobs, bad climate, plague, so forth and so on. And we've got pull factors, which are those things that makes a new place look more interesting, such as a chance of a new job or uh, the discovery of goal, religious freedom, economic advantages, and we can go on and on with those as well. Now, the rate of population change is determined by all the things I've already said. If the birth rate is high and the mortality rate is low, then the population is going to increase. And if the mortality rate is high compared with the birth rate, then the population is going to decline. To determine a country's natural growth rate, we have to take the difference between the crude birth rate and the crude death rate, and this will give you the rate of reproductive change. Now keep in mind, it is a natural increase. It does not take into account in and out migration.
According to Robert Malthus, uh, Thomas Robert Malthus, the population would increase much more rapidly than the food supply. And he believed that the single most important problem associated with the increase in population is an inadequate food supply. And of course, class, we know today that people are starving in underdeveloped nations. Now, the Malthusian theory is the idea that population grows geometrically and the food supply only increases arithmetically, which will eventually lead to mass starvation uh, throughout the world. Now, let me kind of explain this to you. He argued that the natural passions of men and women would lead to a geometrically increasing birth rate. In other words, the rate was going to increase very rapidly. And at the same time, food production would increase only arithmetically because of limitations on agricultural production and so forth and so on. Therefore, population would outstrip the available food to support it. Malthus believed that checks on the population are required, and according to Malthus, there are only two ways to check the population explosion. And these are with positive checks and preventive checks. Positive checks are natural ways of prevention, such as famine, disease, war. It doesn't sound too positive, but just natural ways of dying. And preventive checks is the use of moral restraint. He advocated sexual abstinence, birth control, delayed marriage. And Malthus believed that if population growth is not controlled, by either positive or preventive checks, and the population's demand for food will exceed the supply. Now, class, his argument was undermined. Uh, first of all, new birth control techniques came into use. We have a greater cultural emphasis on smaller families. We've, we've had technological improvements. But some of his ideas are still relevant, such as the increase in population has certainly threatened our available resources. Population growth has led to the paving over of arable land. The required uh, resources uh, are putting a strain on our ecosystem. The goal of the world is zero population growth. And of course, this is when populations result in a stable size. And the way this is achieved is when parents only have two children. It is just enough to replace themselves. The United States has had a growth rate, or, or they had a growth rate just below the zero population growth in 1979. But the population still grew because immigration exceeded immigration. In other words, we had more people moving into the area than we had moving out. I don't believe the United States will ever achieve zero population growth. Also, zero population growth has to be maintained consistently for at least 25 years to result in a stable population. Urbanization is the growth of the number of people who live in urban rather than rural areas and the development of different values and lifestyles. So it's more or less just the, the concentration of population into cities. Before an area can be considered a urban area, you've got to have at least 2,500 uh, inhabitants. Anything less than that is considered to be rural. The very first city that we know of was Jericho. And class, I want to say at that time, there were probably only about 600 uh, people, okay, if you will, that, that lived in that area. And it kind of gives a breakdown of, of the growth of cities here.
a metropolitan uh, era, area or, or community is, is a large, densely populated city which uh, does perform the routine functions necessary to sustain the existence of both the city and the area that surround it. Um, in order for an area to be considered metropolitan, you've got to have at least 100,000 occupants. And in class, there, there's over 300 metropolitan cities in the United States. And we all know that the growth of those metropolitan areas has been rapid, it's dramatic. Um, it's always growing, okay? It, it's like it's not static, it's forever growing. Now, the area that extends beyond the uh, metropolitan city is a megalopolis. This is a vast urban region containing a number of cities and their surrounding suburbs. It's kind of hard to tell where one stops and, and the other one begins. One of the most influential models during the early development of ecological theory was the concentric zone model. It was developed by Mr. Ernest Burgess and Robert Parts from the University of Chicago. Um, and what this theory shows, or this model shows, is urban expansion occurs through a series of invasions. Now, what the concentric zone model is, is, is just a bunch of circles on top of each other. Um, and according to this theory, a city spreads out equally in all directions from its original center, and each zone has its own characteristic. Now, there are five different zones. It's important that you know these zones. It's important that you know what's happening in each one of the zones. So let's look at this uh, first and foremost. In the center part of the model, you've got the innermost zone. This is the central business di district. Zone two is zone in transition. This is where social problems are widespread. It's characterized by poverty, deteriorating housing, disease, crime, low, cost, uh, low housing cost, and we can go on and on with, with some of the characterizations of, of the zone in transition. Now, moving out from, from these two zones, the innermost zone and the zone in transition, living conditions are going to improve. Zone number three is the zone of working class homes. And like I said, people move here to escape those con conditions of zone two. Zone four is the residential zone. This is where wealthy people live. And then as you move out farther, you've got the commuter zone which consists of suburban areas and smaller communities. And I can see why it's called the commuter zone because people that live out this far are having to commute back and forth into the city to work. Now, looking at this class, cities tend to expand outward from their business centers. And it also shows how succession works. One group enters an area as prior residents leave for better living conditions.